All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Boski Savla. Um, I am a technical marketing manager in VMware. I work a lot on our cloud native solutions around Kubernetes like PKS, um, Olympus, or Tanzu that you heard yesterday. Um, and for today's session, I only have 15 minutes, but what I wanted to do, do was quickly go over why Kubernetes or how does Kubernetes sit on top of vSphere. Most of us have vSphere somewhere in our data center and Kubernetes is this new thing that's coming up. Everybody's talking about it. Um, so let's see how can we fit that on vSphere. As a background, I've been a Linux system admin. I moved on to being a VI admin, a solution engineer, and then I've been at VMware doing various roles for the last eight years, all right? So, um, you know, Kubernetes is something very similar to what vCenter does for ESXi hosts. So if you have a bunch of ESXi hosts and a bunch of virtual machines to run, you need something like vCenter to orchestrate all of that, to create a cluster so that you can load balance your virtual machines, et cetera. So think about Kubernetes as doing the same, but for containerized applications or container images. So if you give Kubernetes a bunch of hosts, it's going to distribute your containers across those one bunch of hosts. So it's, a, uh, it's an orchestrator. That's one of the functions that Kubernetes does, but it does more beyond that, and we'll get into that a little bit. So why developers love Kubernetes is it, it brings together infrastructure in a way where developers can define a requirement in a simple file, give it to Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes takes it, talks to your infrastructure, and makes it happen. It's kind of like magic. Today, if you think about how developers work, most likely there's a ticket-based approach to I need a virtual machine or here is my app, I want you to run it, throw it around to IT. IT has to figure out how to manage it, how to load balance it, how to secure it, so on and so forth. With Kubernetes, the idea is that you're creating a single um, framework where developers can come in and say, Here's my app, it's containerized. Please run it for me. Make sure that you have five copies while you're running it. Make sure you're load balancing it. Make sure this is the port that you need to load balance it. And um, maybe it has some security elements that they can define at the same time. And what Kubernetes does is it takes those configs or it takes, it's, it's very similar to like what Puppet, to, uh, Puppet does to configuration management. It maintains states. Kubernetes does that for orchestrating containers uh, or applications in containers. So um, a classic example of Kubernetes is, let's say you have an Ubuntu image that has an app that you put in a Docker container and um, you give the container along with a YAML file to Kubernetes and you say, here is my container image. Um, my app is already in it, run it for me. Kubernetes will go talk to vSphere. If your infrastructure is vSphere, it will deploy it in as a pod in a virtual machine, and then it will have it running there. Similarly, if you need a persistent volume, containers, the thing with virtual machines is we tie the two together, a virtual machine uh, operating system application and the storage needed for that. With containers, you're kind of separating all of those requirements. So a container image, when it's running, it has ephemeral storage, it won't save data. If you have a database that you want to run, you have to define a persistent volume. So there are multiple things that you can do with Kubernetes, but essentially the point is, Kubernetes is only passing those parameters down to infrastructure. Um, it is not doing any magic at that layer except passing parameters. So what that really means is that your infrastructure that you're running on Kubernetes, uh, that Kubernetes is running on top of has to be fluid it has to understand what Kubernetes needs. When a developer comes and says to Kubernetes, I need X, Y, Z, Kubernetes or the infrastructure that's running on it has to figure out what do I do to it. Like if there is a persistent volume that uh, it needs to be provisioned, Kubernetes is just going to go down to the node that is hosting the pod and say, get me a 10, 10 gigabyte of persistent volume. The pod is then, I mean, the pod doesn't have storage. So the infrastructure, for example, if you're running on vCenter, has to create or carve out a VMDK disk of 10 gigabytes and then mount it to the corresponding virtual machine where that pod is running. 
all of this is automated, but that's what needs to happen and you know in, in terms of the infrastructure. And Kubernetes has multiple um, so what it does is if you have an application requirement, for example, if you want to deploy an app, you want to figure out what the replicas should be, what high availability you have, what load balancing or network requirements you have, what security requirements you have, what upgrade requirements you have. Today we are really looking at the infrastructure APIs, whether you're in vSphere, whether in AWS, whether you're in Google Cloud, you're really talking directly to that cloud's infrastructure API. And then you're managing your applications around that. Sometimes we also use things like Ansible, Chef, Puppet to manage all of that or automate all of that. And you know what Kubernetes does is it, it sits right between your application requirements and in front of your infrastructure and defines those requirements in standard frameworks. So for example, if you have um, replication needs where you need an app to be replicated multiple times, there is something called as a replica set in Kubernetes. It's an API endpoint. You define that, and when you define a replica set, Kubernetes will create five replicas for that, right? So you're only going to, and it doesn't matter whether you're running on vSphere then, or whether you're running on Google Cloud, or whether you're running on AWS. You're defining it once, you can change your infrastructure, and correspondingly, Kubernetes will implement it still the same way, but using another infrastructure provider. So the way Kubernetes does that is it has plugins for different resources that are needed. Essentially, an app always needs compute requirements, network requirements, and storage requirements. So Kubernetes has plugins by which it understands how to work with an infrastructure provider. So if you look at the open source project today, there are multiple vendors, multiple systems that integrate with Kubernetes. Um, from a cloud provider perspective, Google, Azure, vSphere, uh, AWS, they all integrate with Kubernetes to provide compute resources to a container. From a network perspective, because Kubernetes is running like pods that are in a virtual machine and you know there's some nesting going on over there, so you need container networks to operate. So there are multiple network providers that integrate with Kubernetes and so on for storage. With VMware, let's say if you have to run um, a workload or Kubernetes on VMware, what we have done is we have created, working within the Kubernetes community, these plugins that help you implement Kubernetes cluster with all the automation that comes with Kubernetes natively within vSphere. So, as an example, um, if you have uh, persistent volume needs, you know the automation where Kubernetes is going to talk to vCenter and then vCenter is going to provide a VMTK disk and mount it to that virtual machine, it's all automatically done by the vSphere cloud provider that sits on the Kubernetes cluster. And this cloud provider, again, it's something that uh, the VMware engineers are working within the open source community. It's all free, it's openly available. Similarly, for if you have NSX, there's something called as the NS NCP plugin, uh, which is going to automate the build out of services, pod networks, container networks, all of that. Again, this is uh, something that NSBU or the networking team has created specifically to make sure all these sphere workloads have that ubiquitous seamless integration created. Now let's look at what a Kubernetes cluster looks like in terms of uh, how it's laid out. So you have a bunch of ESXi hosts that you're pooling together in vSphere with uh, you know, resource pools or clusters. And a Kubernetes cluster will land on that just like another application. But the worker nodes or the master nodes that comprise of a Kubernetes cluster are going to be virtual machines on top of vSphere. So from, from if you look at it, it just looks like another app running on top of vSphere, but a bunch of virtual machines together create the cluster for Kubernetes. And within those virtual machines, you will have all the Kubernetes components deployed like kubeproxy, whatever Kubernetes needs to operate. You'll have the control plane as one of the virtual machine, you'll have the worker node as another virtual machine, so on and so forth. So the pods or the containers are going to run within those virtual machines. They're going to derive their resources from the virtual machines that they're hosted in. Um, if you look at networking, the idea is that 
you know, because you have a container that's sitting in a pod that is sitting in a virtual machine, and that virtual machine is probably connected to a virtual vSphere switch, and then eventually to a ESXi host, there's a lot of network layers involved. And to operate a cluster effectively where a developer can have a seamless experience where they have, if they want to deploy a containerized app, they don't necessarily have to go create a ticket to create a container network that they can land their workloads on. It's really necessary to have automated processes that can implement all of these together. So if you think about it, we need a pod network that's uplinked to the node network. The node network is where the virtual machines reside. And that virtual machine network should be uplinked to your V switch or DV switches. And then the DV switch, again, of course, is through a uh, bridge to your uh, ESXi host uh, uplinks. And there should be routing between all of this. The pod network has to be virtual. It cannot be physical because if it's running in a virtual machine, right? How do you define a physical network that's running in the virtual machine? And it has to be created in real time. So for example, if I'm coming in, I'm deploying a new Kubernetes cluster, I need a pod network created along with that. If I don't have that, I cannot really operate the cluster. So a lot of this has to happen in real time as people start deploying clusters. Routing also has to be in place. And the other thing is, if you want to expose your applications, you need uh, load balancing to have in place. So logical switching, routing, load balancing, all combined together that is aware of Kubernetes, that is aware of containers, and also works at the virtual machine layer. There are multiple ways to go about doing this. Um, if you already have virtual switches and you're not using NSX, you can use open source tools like Flannel and Calico to do your open vSwitch, or sorry, the container networking. That is the overlay network for containers that can sit on top of vSwitch. Um, if you are using something like F5, you can use that to load balance. Um, uh, your uh, services for Kubernetes. However, the idea is that you'll have to work through different systems. Um, NSX has done all of that together in one place uh, with NCP plugins, with the logical switches, routing, and load balancing that NSX has. So if you're running a vSphere, if you're not using NSX, you can still implement a Kubernetes cluster. But if you're using NSX, it's just going to be much more seamless. So that's how a network is handled within Kubernetes and vSphere. If you're, now let's, let's take a look at how storage works. So let's say, you know, to, if, if you have two pods running in two different virtual machines and they're going to access um, a virtual, you know, a VMDK disk for persistent storage, if the pod moves to another virtual machine, and this is very common, it's like how um, you know, a vCenter DRS cluster will vMotion a virtual machine to another ESXi host. Similarly, a pod can be moved to another virtual machine by Kubernetes just to manage the workloads. And the corresponding storage that was attached to the virtual machine has to move to the new VM now. So there's, there needs to be some automation to do all of that. And that is where the vSphere cloud provider comes in. Uh, this is, again, a Kubernetes uh, upstream open source uh, it was it was called project hatchway it's available on the internet uh, you can download it but what it really does is it, it it understands how kubernetes works it understands how vcenter works so anytime kubernetes uh, gets a request to creating a persistent volume it goes talks to the vcenter it provisions the persistent volume and at matches or at attaches it or uh, mounts it on the virtual machine now, if the pod moves to a different virtual machine, it's going to do the same. It's going to move the VMDK, de, um, demount it from the VM that it was on, and put it back to the, virtual, uh, to the virtual machine or the VM where the new pod lands on. And all of this is really automated. So um, that's how you know, the storage works. So I, I guess that's you know, how vSphere handles Kubernetes in terms of network storage and um, uh, compute. All right, thank you.